welcome you to um, this first session, panel session of today. My name is Andreas Nehring. I'm from the University of Erlangen and I have the pleasure and honor to introduce um, our speaker for this panel today. His name is Liam Geron and you can see him here already. Some of you might know him and he's going to speak on um, the politicization and secularization of religion in education. Securitization. Securitization, sorry. Um, let me just introduce our speaker um, as far as I could find out so far. He is an associate professor in the Department of Education and he is a senior research fellow at the Harris Manchester College, University of Oxford. And um, interestingly, Liam has a doctorate in English literature and um, nevertheless his interests are always or have always been multidisciplinary uh, and also interdisciplinary because he is doing research on religion, politics, education and uh, also literature. He is um, or has been the guest editor of the British Journal for Educational Studies, where um, they have published a special issue on education, security, and intelligence studies. Um, nevertheless, his PhD was on literature, and it was published in um, 2002 under the title Landscapes of Encounter, the portrayal of Catholicism in the novels of Brian Moore. I have to admit I don't know Brian Moore, but maybe this gives me a chance to read some of his novels later. Throughout um, his career, Liam Geron has maintained <laughs> his interdisciplinary research interests and he has done research on political theologies and um, also um, especially on the questions of freedom of expression and uh, how theological and political um, uh, approaches or perspectives work together. Um, so his, his interest, fields of interest are religious, religious education and the role of citizenship, the interface of religion, politics and education and also philosophy of education and its relation to literature. Welcome with me, Liam Garron, and we are looking forward to your lecture. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, as Andreas said, this is the title of my uh, paper, is the politicization and securitization of religion in education, uh, a response to a rejoinder. I'll say a bit about, more about the subtitle shortly. Um, <clears throat> the difference between securitization and secularization, of course, uh, is significant. Um, and maybe in questions we can draw out why then, why and how the two are related. But it is an important uh, correction to make that this is about the politicization and the securitization rather than specifically on the secularization, although I have written fairly extensively on secularization um, of religion in the context of education. Can you go a bit closer to the microphone? The microphone, okay. The microphone does, okay, I will, yes, yes. This is the broad outline of my uh, paper. Um, first of all, some words of introduction. And I want to present some wider context of my work very, very briefly in some recent books I've written in religious education. Uh, and I want to move on to some significant and somewhat trenchant criticisms of my work on security and intelligence studies, uh, on the politicization and securitization of religion in education. Uh, an old friend and colleague of mine, Bob Jackson, and the, trend, the, the, the criticisms are fairly extensive and trenchant, and I will respond to those as my, my first public opportunity to do so. Um, and I want then to make in point four my, my, my considered response uh, and then draw things to a close and a conclusion. I want to say firstly about some words of introduction then. Um, Bob Jackson has written two major papers 
uh, challenging aspects of my work. The first uh, was on my use of Thomas Kuhn and the structure of scientific revolutions on the paradigms of religious education. I don't want to address those criticisms today. Uh, he also wrote an extensive a uh, paper with the title that I'm using today <clears throat> on the politicization and the securitization of religion in education. Uh, and I want to say from the outset that this was in the special issue of the British Journal of Education Studies, one of the UK's oldest education journals, volume 63, number, number three. Uh, and I published uh, Bob's uh, consideration of my work uh, in a journal. I want to say from the outset that as editor I did not have to publish the criticisms of my own work. So I hope this is taken in the spirit of good grace and I would hope that Bob Jackson, as I've communicated to him this fact, it was a vastly oversubscribed special issue, multidisciplinary with uh, experts from security, intelligence, international relations and politics and many of the contributors had to be put into the next issue. But I thought Bob's contribution and his critique of my work was sufficiently important to include uh, within the journal that I edited. Um, I want to make a measured critique of uh, Bob's work, but I do not today, since many of you may not have read this, to engage in the minutiae of his criticisms. In any future publication, uh, formal publication, I will be able to look at some other finer detail. What I want to do today is open up this field of religious education, of public theology, to a wider sphere of influences in the relation to the security and intelligence agencies as they currently operate and have operated historically. Firstly, all, I want to make some brief comments about my recent work in religious education, from which some of this derives. Uh, I wrote recently three, uh, two major books, one uh, called A Masterclass, in religious education, um, edited, uh, the series edited from the University of Cambridge. I was invited to write this book. The second, uh, and in a sense my uh, major work really in religious education, what I consider to be my major work in religious education, was a book called On Holy Ground, um, and also a paper I published in the Journal of the Study of Religion on the Paradigms of Religious Education. And I want to make it clear from the outset that I'm afraid that Bob Jackson has fairly misconceived my analysis in both of those books. When he claims that I am suggesting that initiation into the religious life is the main form of religious education, that is simply factually incorrect. My analysis deals with non-confessional religious education, non-confessional religious education and the problems with which it is confronted. And in both the masterclass in the On Holy Ground, I, I begin with a basic premise. My basic premise is this, that the problem of modern religious education remains how to ground the subject when it is no longer grounded in the religious life. That is, once it is no longer grounded in the religious life, it's not meant to be a contentious statement. It's like, what alternative grounds do we have to seek in order to ground in a philosophical sense, epistemologically, what, how do we ground the subject? It is not intended as a contentious statement, and it is not about the initiation into the religious life. It's about the context of non-confessional religious education, although it may have some implications for confessional religious education. So I detail this uh, in, in a book, uh, Masterclass in Religious Education, published in 2013. And in this book, um, it has uh, six chapters, introduction, conclusion, six chapters. Chapter five, I think, is my major contribution, or a contribution, um, to the field of religious education. And in only one chapter, in a brief outline, I outline what I determine as six paradigms of religious education. I think carefully applying Thomas Kuhn's uh, notion of paradigm and paradigm shift in religious education. I'm not going to detail all of these. However, I think we can say in religious education, in contemporary religious education, perhaps since the founding of the US Journal around 1903-04, that religious education has shifted when it is no longer grounded in the religious life, whatever religious tradition that is. And it has shifted significantly away from the scriptural and theological focus with which religious education was predominantly uh, uh, concerned. 
we see this even from the, from, from the introductions from the bishop and the archbishop yesterday, where we see the, the major shift into these other sorts of areas. Uh, I detail in outline only in this book the, con the, the, the principal problem, I think, that, uh, uh, that, that some of my critics have is in relation to the sixth paradigm, um, the political, the historical. In my own holy ground, I, in a sense, answer many of the uh, criticisms raised of my use of Thomas Kern, and I think fairly substantially in this book, um, um, on holy ground. I'll just say a bit about the title. The title, of course, comes from, as those of us will know, Exodus, from the time that Moses approaches the burning bush, and God tells Moses to remove his sandals because where he is standing is holy ground. I'm using both the Exodus term as a starting point, but I'm also using it in a dual sense on holy ground in the epistemological or philosophical sense. As I said, how does religious education ground itself when it is no longer grounded in the religious life? And this chapter makes a systematic analysis, um, systematic analysis of the history of ideas, origins, how, what I do is I, I look at these post-Enlightenment disciplines. Of course, some of these disciplines are pre-Enlightenment, philosophy, natural sciences, but many found their contemporary identity post-Enlightenment. And all of them, all of them found their identity in relation to a critique of religion. Every single one of those, I would argue, found, founded their uh, authority as disciplines, as forms of knowledge in relation to religion. Now, obviously, I can't expand on the detail of that thesis, but I think it is fairly clear and elaborated. So what I do is, in each of these disciplines, I look at the relationship between those disciplines and religion, so psychology and religion, its origins, sociology and its origins in relation to religion, its critique of religion, and so forth. And then what I do is I look at how religious education has appropriated, has appropriated each of these disciplines. Now, let's move then on to uh, the third point, which is, uh, which is Robert Jackson's critique of my uh, politicization and securitization. So Rob draws upon specific aspects of my work, particularly in relation to the political. This is the paper that he published within the British Journal of Education Studies, a generic journal, and I thought it was important to have that context. Um, you can see from the extent of it, this is a 10,000 word uh, article that he's written systematically reviewing, and I cannot here have the time to go into the minutiae. Uh, I will say, I suppose, two things in essence. First of all, Bob Jackson's analysis lacks historical perspective and understanding. His consistent use of terms like civil religion are presented in numerous cases, particularly in a 2000 and pep, uh, 2007 paper, without any reference whatsoever to the contemporary use of the term civil religion, which is in itself, of course, a politicization of religion, nor is there any reference to the penultimate chapter of Rousseau's social contract, which is entitled civil religion. And if we read Rousseau, we see that the relationship to religion, civil religion, in that chapter is quite antagonistic. Bella's, of course, is much more uh, conciliatory. So I think, first of all, that there is a lack of historical perspective it's looking at religious education as if it, if it was originated within the past several decades. This is an inadequate in analysis, but I think it's worth putting out there in, in paper. <clears throat> I'm not going to discuss too much today on the politicization of religion. This is a forum on political theology, and this is very much discussed in many ways. What is less discussed are the security and intelligence agency operations here. Um, <clears throat> and this debate, I think, is less familiar, and I want to unpack some of the mechanisms by which the security and intelligence agencies work and why my thesis, I think, is fairly firm in its foundations and fundamentally correct. And I think the second point, apart from the lack of historical analysis in um, Robert Jackson's uh, uh, critique, is a fundamental failure to understand the operations of security and intelligence agencies as they currently operate, also a failure to understand 
uh, contemporary security theory, and I will outline this for you. We see one of my areas of uh, uh, analysis and focus, which actually prompted me uh, to consider the security aspects of these questions, was in the document which we all will know, uh, called the Toledo Guidelines, Guiding Principles on Teaching About Religions and Beliefs. Um, I must say from the outset, both, both here within, uh, within my criticisms, and I apply much to the REDCO project, I will say my students at Oxford will be witness to the fact that I'm always extremely positive about Bob Jackson's work, his major contributions over a sustained period of time, and also the, the, the important work the REDCO project has been undertaken, has undertaken. I am, however, less sanguine, less optimistic about the procedures behind this document. And for reasons which many people seem to neglect are the small initials which appear at the bottom of the page. The OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights below. I read another paper which was called The Counter-Terrorist Classroom, which I, which, in which I analyze the progressive securitization of religious education or religion in education. Now, I am charged in this paper by Bob Jackson with being highly emotive. I'm also charged with being highly emotive for the use, introduction of the terms security and securitization within the context of this debate. Now, I will say now from the outset that if war, mass murder, slaughter, and terrorism are not things that we can become emotive out about and in which can inform our arguments, I'm sorry, but I do not understand where the place of emotion would have in academic life. Now, these issues that I'm discussing now are very serious. I will unpack the implications of some of these, this Toledo, this Toledo guidance. The guidance are perfectly uh, familiar to us. They're not, they don't on the surface seem uh, particularly uh, bad guidelines. They're, they're, they're in line with, with current uh, educational thinking. Let me just tell you a fundamental outline. I'll, I'll outline in a couple of sentences the modern structure of contemporary security studies. There are two divisions within security studies, in the academic study of security, but also within the, the operation of the security services, which includes the military. On the, un, on the one hand, there are people who are called the traditionalists or realists, traditionalists or realists, who say that security should be concerned with the military, with warfare, defense and those classic things which we associate with, with, with the military and the security. On the other hand of security studies, and also within the security and intelligence community, uh, and this essentially has won the day, as you will see when I, when I outline some of this more further. On the other hand, there are people called, the, the, uh, another group called the wideners and the deepeners, who see that security and intelligence cannot be simply a matter of military, <coughs> and uh, technological things connected with the hardware of war. They can't be concerned with that. The wideners and deepers have wi extended the frame of security and intelligence studies. So those, I think, in brief are my, uh, my, my, a summary of where, where I'm going to, going to lead this discussion. Um, so in relation to this, for example, I'm suggested that OSCE is not concerned with the Toledo guidelines. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. The OSCE has labeled here on the guidelines. <coughs> the, of, the, the, the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, which is based somewhere else than uh, OSCE, they've another office, they're, they're integrally connected. And they're connected to what is sometimes called the Human Security Project. In other words, security is concerned with the security of the human being. Now, this means matters of education, health, culture and so forth. It's a much wider remit. And I kind of wish that Bob Jackson would have engaged more uh, positively, I suppose, in recognizing that there is a political and security dimension to this work that we're all engaged with. I want to bring some of this into the open. 
So let me just demonstrate from the Office of Demo uh, the ODIHR what they say themselves on their own website. This is from the, this is from this the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. They acknowledge openly that this is a matter of security. And they say, let me read this in essence, what they're saying in this big long quote is that it is about the security of the human. I mean, it's interesting use of the language, of course. Look at the state of detachment that these the security agencies are using. And this is one step removed in the cultural aspect of security. And this, as I will explain, the security agencies, they use all, intelligence agencies use all sorts of mechanisms behind the scenes, integral, integral into society. I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. But as, as, as a colleague of mine said uh, only recently, it's good to name this. Once we name something, we can then begin to explore. That's what I'm saying. So the ODIHR themselves acknowledge that this is about human security. And one of these aspects is the question of how religious education and religion in education can form. So that's what that long quote is in, in essence. So <clears throat> let me get on to some substantive expanding then. Uh, because I don't think this has substantially been done. I outline much of this in my editorial for this special issue on education, security, and intelligence studies. I'm not going to make too explicit the, the, the direct role of religion here. And for this reason, when I was asked to guest edit this uh, UK journal, the generic journal, I was very conscious not to have the title extremism, radicalization, Islam or any other such leading title within the frame of the journal because I wanted to expand the broader themes of the relationship. This question of security and intelligence is not simply to do with Islam. It is not simply to do with extremism. It is not simply to do with radicalization. If we make that fundamental mistake, we will go not very far. We will go not very far. We will not see the place of those issues, um, those important issues, within the wider context. So this is the special issue that I, uh, that I outlined. <coughs> so this for me was quite, a, quite an inroad into a new area. There is, I think, no journal that has, in fact, addressed this particular interface. It is to do with school education, it's to do with universities, <coughs> and also non-formal educational settings. I also held a symposium uh, at the British, our British Academy in central London in November uh, 12th in, uh, in, in 2015, uh, where, I, where I brought speakers together, some distinguished people, experts in the security services like the CIA, GCHQ, which is our listening or surveillance uh, uh, agency, works closely with MI5 and MI6, brought these types of people together to address the questions of education, what's going on here. Just an opening symposium, very, very well attended um, by a diverse range of disciplines. And for all the talk of this interdisciplinarity, there is so often so little of it actually going on in practice. It's difficult, and I never pretend to be the absolute expert on security. I always defer to the authority of those within other fields. What I'm trying to do is to facilitate a discussion. And in that respect, I am uh, currently principal investigator for a funded seminar series, uh, multidisciplinary on uh, on education, security, and intelligence studies, drawing in a lot of uh, universities, but also uh, institutions and groups that work with the intelligence agencies. Let me tell you a bit about the security agencies. The post-Second World War, spying, of course, has been going on. I mean, that's what it is. Spying has been going on, you know, since uh, biblical times. We know, um, we see this in frequent references in the, the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures people going ahead to various cities, searching out the ground. In modern times, if we can skip a few thousand years of history, uh, in the post-1945 period is very significant for the development of the intelligence agencies, particularly in America. 
Um, in Britain, we've had a formalized uh, intelligence agencies, MI5 and MI6. The M refers to the military section of the, of the work that they were doing and illustrates really the military, traditional military associations of these spy agencies. MI5, in case you don't know, deals with our homeland security, so to speak. MI6 is our foreign intelligence agency. In America, uh, after the Second World War, there was uh, a move to increasingly uh, operationalize and professionalize um, the United States uh, intelligence agencies. It is the time of the formation of the Central Intelligence Agency. There is somebody, a very big figure there called Sherman Kent, who claimed that we have the professionalization, developing professionalization. What we don't have is a literature in a very famous paper he wrote in 1955, Sherman Kent. And much of the modern study of intelligence goes back to Sherman Kent. So in the, after the Second World War period, it's a very interesting period, the formation of the intelligence agencies in the United States. They learned a lot, especially from the UK. They also learned a lot, of course, from their explicit op uh, operations within the Second World War, you know, by putting these techniques and uh, approaches uh, in operation. The Cold War was an interesting period here because the Cold War saw that although that we were not in a time of active conflict, except for those sorts of conflicts in Latin America, in Africa, which were proxies, of course, for the, for, for the, second, uh, for the, for the Cold War, we did see an increasing uh, use of um, intelligence security operations, both military and also important. How would we define the other side of the operations? Ideological. It is the ideological operation that really essentially has led to the widening and deepening of security and intelligence concerns. The Cold War was so ideologically driven that that is what has led to the present day widening and deepening of our understanding of intelligence. This person, Michael Herman, is a, a towering figure <coughs> within, within this field. And his important book, uh, Intelligence, Power in Peace and War, shows the importance of intelligence, not only in, in armed conflict, but also within peacetime. I would make an interesting parallel um, here. I was talking to, uh, uh, to uh, mention this Jenny to you last evening. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an area which would require, I think this is just begs really for further empirical investigation. I would love to do a more systematic empirical observation about <coughs> the OSCE. And I think Bob Jackson's right there, really, that you know, there is more to be looked at here about these operations, what they're doing. But remember, of course, that these are the people that when Ukraine or Crimea was uh, collapsing, the OSCE people, the men and women, were those with the OSCE on the back of the jack jackets. They were the ones that were hanging around in Crimea. I mean, these are the hardcore people looking at monitoring. They originate within the Cold War, and they're there, there, they've not gone away. Okay, and so my question would be, what is the Cold War security organization doing devising uh, guiding principles for the teaching of religion in public schools? That is a fundamental question. Um, a parallel between the OSC, I'll just say this briefly. There is an absolutely fabulous book, the only book that has been written on this, it's called Propaganda and Intelligence in the Cold War. We've all heard of NATO. We've all heard of NATO, of course. Um, military organization. NATO has a parallel organization which has been established since its, since its origins called NATIS. N-A-T-I-S. This is the only book uh, uh, written on the topic. NATIS stands for the NATO Information Service. Intelligence is all about one thing knowledge, knowledge and information. And of course, now, as we all know, that has been extremely diversified. NATIS is the parallel organization to NATO. Linda Rosso has, uh, Risso has outlined in very, very systematic ways in which the intelligence agencies have operated through their NATIS organization in all sorts of cultural domains, including in ways which came to me as a complete and utter surprise. Let me just use one example. The formation and foundation of Departments of American Studies. The formation and establishment, especially within UK Western universities, of 
American studies. What's that got to do with security? Behind the foundation of those departments was the presentation of a positive image of the United States. For example, if you look at when those departments were founded, it runs exactly parallel with what war? The Vietnam War. The foundation is presenting those departments, is establishing a positive relationship, a positive image to the world and to Western students of America. So we have the foundation in many universities of departments of American studies. Now, as they say, follow the money. You know, it's very difficult to follow the trail of this money because this is in budgets which is concealed under billions upon billions and it is, it is you know, it is difficult, but there is very substantial evidence of, of cultural involvement there. Okay, let me move on. Um, so we see the widening and deepening here. And so we see various kinds of intelligence, various kinds of intelligence, military, political, health, cultural, including the educational. What I outline is an integral relationship between three things in, in my uh, analysis. First of all, the intelligence agencies have historically been covert. They've been hidden. In recent times, because of the need to be more accountable, they've become overt. The concern and question is where the boundary blurs between where they're being covert and where they're being overt. So this is the critical problem. How do we know when the intelligence services are operating and when they're not, not operating? Well, partly because they are who they are, we don't always know. The UK context, I said this was a serious sort of setting. These sorts of questions come into play <coughs> with things like counterterrorism and, uh, and Security Act. There have been multiple consultations with universities, the Russell Group of universities. UK universities have been involved in these considerations about security and intelligence with major papers. And the oversight is not only about freedom of expression, it's about the dangerous stuff that universities have, the labs the biological, the chemical, the, the physics sort of work that they have. And so we say this whole frame has become widened and education has become an increasingly important forum here. I'll zip through five forms of intelligence collection. This is a very important book by Lowenthal and Clark. That I'm using here open source material from the FBI to identify the five major sources of intelligence collection that the agencies use. First of all, it's human intelligence, talking to people. <coughs> Talk to people is a basic, basic standard of intelligence gathering. Signals intelligence. This devises areas of electronic submission and it's collected ships, planes, ground sites, satellites. Okay, so there's signals intelligence. Imagery intelligence. This is the photographing the Google Earth solar line, but at a far, far more sophisticated level. Massint is measurement of signatures intelligence, which is the attempt to find secret weapons is the basic code for this stuff. Massint, it's called. Measurement of signatures analysis. Where are the signs of chemical, bacteriological, or nuclear type of activity? This is the big one, really, where universities come into play significantly. Intelligence agencies cannot gather all of the information around now. So this area is an important area with those other four. Open source intelligence called OSINT. Newspapers, radio, television. I could tell you a little bit about how the intelligence agencies do that and how they monitor that, in what languages they monitor it and so forth. But that's the basic principle. So this open source, the USIC is the US intelligence community. But a lot of this will apply to agencies both within the UK, within Germany, and across all the European countries. Let me draw to a conclusion. What we can say, and we, I think the leaks from Edward Snowden and uh, uh, WikiLeaks have, in, have indicated to us as a public domain that security and intelligence now incorporates not just everything, but everyone. And in the universities, there are growing, there are growing um, uh, networks for the study of um, intelligence and there is an increasingly organic link between the intelligence agencies and universities themselves. Look at these types of groups. The Intelligence History Association, <coughs> the International Studies Association which was formed about studying area studies which is like studying South America, Africa or any region. This is for, for essentially backed into the CIA, link between the CIA so they can find out information about different countries and different regions. 
Association of Former Intelligence Officers. This is the big one. This is the big one, uh, current one. It's the IAFEIE, the International Association for Intelligence Education. Um, in 2005, Congress established a very, very significant bu uh, budget to establish centers for security and intelligence studies in U.S. universities. We have about eight, nine, ten of them in the U.K. These were directly funded by U.S. government, uh, U US government money. Um, these are the sorts of things that they're designed to do, to design, develop, reshape intelligence, national security-related curricula. Fifty percent of the people that go through these courses enter into the CIA. This is an historic thing. These are some interesting books. I've got 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay? Uh, this, of course, is nothing new. None of this is anything new. There's a lot of uh, operations, both within the covert, uh, especially within the covert history. Uh, Vitanek's book, The CIA on Campus, uh, from 89. Uh, a more recent collection with the same title. <clears throat> and Robert Winks's uh, excellent book, looking at cloak and cloak and gown, the relationships uh, uh, scholars in the secret war. Um, it's not always positive, of course. Cambridge is very famous for the spy ring known as the Cambridge Five. And then Andrew Sinclair's book, uh, The Red and the Blue Intelligence, Treason and the Universities. Um, just two things that how some of these operate, and I will, I will leave and close there. Um, just to say that in my own university, and I've worked with this first group, the Oxford Intelligence Group is a sort of invitation-only group that works directly with the agencies like MI5, MI6, GCHQ, Port and Down, our Bacteriological Research uh, Institute. Cambridge has their own called the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge uh, Intelligence Seminar, jointly hosted by uh, Christopher Andrew, uh, the official biographer of MI5, uh, along with Sir Richard Dearlove. Now, Sir Richard Dearlove, during the Iraq War, you remember the dodgy dossier? the dossier which led to the Iraq War. This was the man that was in charge of that dossier of the from MI6. Where is he now? He's heading up a Cambridge College, Pembroke College, and he's working directly with uh, Christopher Andrew on something called the Security uh, Cambridge uh, Intelligence Seminar. They recruit and they, they train people from absolutely all over the place. I mean, top, top academics. But just to illustrate the relationship between universities, education, is far wider than than my, my, my critic had, uh, had indicated. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Liam, for taking us into this um, complex debate that you have with your colleagues and especially taking us into this uh, wide issue of intelligence, service, intelligence work. Probably most of us um, until today have no idea about uh, this complex field. Um, so therefore, thank you very much. And I thought it was quite convincing now historically how you showed that uh, a securitization of religion is not only related to the issues of fundamentalism. Mm. I, I think it was convincing. <coughs> Nevertheless, um, I think it, for me it would be interesting if we focus our discussion yeah, yeah. for the next 20 minutes now on what impact does this, what you have, on yeah, yeah. religious education of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. and on religion. Yeah, this absolutely. would be interesting for yeah. me to discuss, but probably you have other issues and other questions That's a good which point. you would thank like you. to raise to him. Okay. The floor is open. Do, do you, thank you very thank much. You very, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want me to say a little bit about the religious education aspect of this now? Or? I would be happy, okay, but then, I would have to ask the forum whether you are also interested in the same issues. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, just, I'll just say a few things and we can come back to that. I mean, I think the first thing we can say about religious education that I, I hope to some degree I've demonstrated through the OSCE's involvement in documents like the Toledo Guidelines. How and, how and why they are operating like that is a matter probably connected to political issues like social and community cohesion, but it's also information, uh, information and knowledge gathering. Um, so on the, the, the Toledo guiding principles, for example, the Toledo guidelines are one illustration of a pan-European way in which religious education has involved in it. Uh, to me, it's the major one. I don't know of any significant, I think that's a significant one. But let's get on to the whole terrorism issue, right? Because this affects religious education kind of in very, very serious ways. 
In the UK, in the UK, the curriculum, um, my colleagues, uh, <clears throat> no, let me just answer directly. Um, in, in the UK, well, so we have something called the Prevent Agenda, which is part of one of the requirements of our 2015 Counterterrorism and Security Act. <clears throat> the Prevent Agenda, however, was not introduced by our conservative, current conservative government, was introduced by our Labour government, was maintained by the coalition. Now that's important because it says that there is cross-party support for the use of counter-terrorism processes and procedures within, uh, increasingly within schools, but it, with a new legislation increasingly within universities, okay? In religious education, this means that um, teachers have a responsibility, and it's not only religious education teachers have a responsibility now to identify those pupils, those students, um, s potentially subject to radicalization and extremism, which includes not only violent extremism, but what they call non-violent extremism. So this is an important and very critical area where teachers have a responsibility, which in a sense extends beyond the curriculum. But to what extent, however, and this I think is also important, to what extent does this affect the way that the teachers teach the subject as well? That they must teach it in a certain type of way. Um, so there's that, that prevent. The responsibilities, though, also extend in religious education directly. And now at Oxford, I, de I deliver the annual prevent lecture because universities themselves also have that responsibility. And it's only now where public bodies like universities have the responsibilities for, well, what other word would you like me to use but informing on individuals who are, may be subject to radicalization, extremism, and so on? What other word would you like me to use? I think that's the word that we're talking about. There are bodies set up in the UK where teachers, educators can inform responsible authorities of these individuals. What's different now in the UK since 2015 is that this becomes a binding legal responsibility upon these public institutions, schools and universities. How does it affect, uh, it even affects, and maybe just one more word on this, it even affects what in England we have called, uh, it is England rather than the wider UK, Teachers have to fulfill certain standards before, teacher standards. In the first, it's the usual assessment and so forth, <coughs> planning, subject knowledge. In the second area, it is their professional standards. Within there, there is one bullet point, which is, doesn't mention prevent, it doesn't mention counterterrorism, which states that teachers must uphold, must uphold, uh, democratic values and fundamental British values. Fundamental British values. This is a very big debate in the UK at the moment about the nature of British values. Now I'm saying that important in relation to extremism in religion because views and opinions and actions which are deemed to be contrary to British values would fit into the category of needing to be informed upon. But when, how, the mechanisms and so forth. Every one of our schools now has this prevent training. There are agencies that operate this. My new teachers go into schools and then they fulfill the training. So I think we're in very new days really here. And I think both within the curriculum, I've illustrated through, for example, the OSCE, um, uh, but also in terms of teachers' wider professionalism. And religious education teachers, because they are responsible for teaching this subject, and again, I mean, it very often does come down to, to, to Islam, um, they are the ones that are often charged with then providing and going on the further training and so forth. But that's to touch upon the subject. But thank you for your question, Andreas. Please, <coughs> Sorry. As you well know, I have no problem at all with the notion of religious education getting heavily into this space. Yeah. That's the sort of thing I've argued for in, in Australia. Um, 
I can imagine a lot of religious educators' heads spinning to, to, to hear this because it would be so different from what they are <coughs> trained to do. Um, it's surprising to me that uh, Bob Jackson would find any problem with it. If I'd had to guess, I would have thought Bob would be you know, well into this space because he's done so much serious <coughs> into religious work and taken religious education into public space. So it sort of sharpens the mind a bit yeah. uh, about you know, what are the different conceptions of religious education, particularly when it aligns itself with something like public theology as a concept. Mm. I mean, in that context, not, not thinking about the personal um, you know, tussle or whatever, but just in that context of conceptions of RE, what, what's your analysis of, of Bob's issue? Um, <clears throat> I, well, well, to some degree, uh, there are two points. There's the politicization, and then there's the securitization. Um, I, think, I think the objections I think the objections are, on relation to the first, is that I have misconceived too close a collusion between European agencies like the, the, the Council of Europe and so forth and their human rights agenda and my remarks about Redco and the work that they have done. I think that has been the problem. I think the, the, the issue has been uh, the question of, let's say, uh, academic integrity I think this is the charge that they sense that I am making. Uh, too close a relationship between funding conclusions and the findings of projects. Too close an alliance between religious education and those issues of democracy and human rights. I say to my students, I said to my students only the other day, when we're looking at national guidance on religious education, religious education should be there to uphold and promote democracy and human rights. I say to them, where did that come from? I say, oh, look, I'm not against democracy and human rights, but where did it come from? And so I try to sort of push their thinking to say, just, just stop for a minute, okay, we're, yes, we will engage in this, like in a forum like this, the importance of democracy and human rights. But let's just take a little step here and let's go back to see where this has originated because otherwise it becomes like an imposition of a particular agenda. So I think the objection is uh, the, the charge of academic um, integrity, academic independence, that my charge is more fundamentally, however, that my charge is more fundamentally that religious education has become too dominated by these political agendas. It's become too dominated by these political agendas. I actually still go into schools. I supervise students. I sit in the back of classrooms. I talk to children. I see what's on the walls. And I see so often that these political agendas, laudable and good as they might be, have squeezed out so many other things. Now, I was going to make a reference before I go on to the securitization to a book my colleagues uh, Jim Conroy and others have made, uh, written a very excellent book called um, an excellent book called uh, Does Religious Education Work? They came to very similar conclusions to me um, about the crowding agenda of religious education from an empirical standpoint. They looked at schools and what they found is that religious education has got so many competing agendas that it's sometimes difficult for teachers. And again, their work was not polemical. It was just they came to the conclusion that there were so many agendas. My thoughts in the politicization, the objection that Robert Jackson would come up with, is that, <clears throat> that it might like, like the dominance, that my charge, that religious education has become too dominant by the political. Very briefly on the security, because I've talked a lot about that. I'm sorry, but Bob Jackson is just simply and utterly in denial that there is any security and securitization going on whatsoever. And if somebody simply denies the facts, I mean, how are you going to engage with them? That would have been far more useful in this debate. There is a fundamental denial in that paper that he's charged me that, that my use of the terms security and securitization are simply emotive. They're not. They're factual. And they're factually accurate. So, I mean, that would be my response, Terry. Thank you. Um, there are 
several more uh, hands I saw, mm -hmm. so I would like to ask you to your question briefly and maybe I will be brief. Short yeah. yes, I will. yes I will I'll give one word answers okay no no no, no. Uh, I would like to, to first of all I think a big problem with this is of course that where should students pupils turn if they have questions about religion yeah. it has to do with radic radicalization yeah, yeah. points and, and this is a major problem for RE teachers sure. and other teachers today that you know if most probably if the pupil's name is Ali, they would have to report if he asks about this female, yeah. but they wouldn't report John. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is what we can see in the UK. Mm. In yeah. I also come across this quite uh, <laughs> concretely when I've been around to Muslim schools in the UK, sure. and they yeah, say, absolutely. good that you're Swedish, because you're not British. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think that links to, to, to this. But, but then to my question, uh, in terms of, of the non-confessional RE uh, that you have in the UK and in Sweden we also have a non-confessional RE yeah. which is similar but not the same as the UK. Andrew Wright has uh, criticized uh, the non-confessional mm. RE and saying that it's becoming a romanticized, a naturalized yeah. version yeah. of religion yeah. and I do agree on the critique of that also in the Swedish case but what is the alternative? So I would like yeah. to hear a bit more about what, what, yeah, I see your critique, I understand it, and I agree to a certain point of it, but what is, what do you think would be the alternative? Um, I'm not, Jenny, actually, uh, let me go to the first point, I agree about the Muslim perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't just, when I do this prevent lecture, I, I'm, I'm very cautious to have, to, just very quickly, to say teachers that work with prevent in schools. Now, it's very also, I'm very cautious about wishing to be tokenistic, but also within when I give this lecture almost every time, well, every time, I will have a, a Muslim, one of my former, you know, very knowledgeable Muslim students to say, well, how does this affect the Muslim community? How is this, how is this charged? Um, now, Bob Jackson says the very same thing to me about what is my, uh, what is my uh, alternative perspective on uh, religious education. Well, I've been working within the, alter within the field of religious education uh, for, for, for close on, I suppose, about 30 years. I was, I was taught by uh, Ninian Smart at Lancaster. I was, I was I, you know, kind of grown up within the phenomenological framework, the multidisciplinary, the sociological, the anthropological, the sociopsychological study of religion. I'm not, in fact, arguing that we should have an alternative, but we don't, you know, we don't, we don't, in a sense, have alternatives. These post-enlightenment disciplines, the psychology, the sociology, and so forth, are very useful ways in which can inform religious education, and they've done fantastic work. The Redco project, the political dimension of religion, it's fantastic. I've written, I've spent 10 years previously, where I've, where I've previously worked 10 years, on the relationship with religious, religious education and citizenship. They're all very important. All, I'm, all I was really trying to do in the paradigms was to identify what the origins of these were to help clarify our thoughts in terms of, say, the history of ideas rather than just the recent history of religious education. And I'm not, I should make it plain, I say critique, Jenny, that's good, but I'm not really even critiquing the security and intelligence operations. Because, you know, without the security and intelligence agencies, you know, I'm not one of those people that's kind of full of suspicion and paranoia. All I'm just saying is, well, let's look at this, and if we've got this, how can we do it? So in terms of the framework, and in my teaching uh, at the university where I work, um, I try to help students to say, when you see this in a curriculum, when you see this aim and objective, we teach them aims and objectives, right? Stop just for a little while and see where does this come from. So you clarify, and this will also help to clarify where your aims come from, where the school aims comes from, and where national religious education aims from. So I'm not actually arguing for a radical type of shift, but just for a little bit more clarity on, on, of thought on that. But thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I would like to take up um, two of your terms. The one is uh, uh, on holy ground. Yeah which uh, I think is important for you, and the other that you say there is nearly no connection to living religion in what RD uh, is well. the, the, at present. Um, I'm uh, not very happy that uh, the German concepts of leaders' education in state schools 
are so little recognized in the international field. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we have the cooperation yeah. with uh, the religious communities and the state. The state says we cannot uh, just fix uh, the ideas of religious education, it's, it's to, to the religious communities. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, in combination uh, between uh, state institutions and the religious communities. The communities uh, develop the syllabuses, but they are of course examined by, by the state. Yeah. And the same we have in, uh, in, in teacher training. Uh, so it makes uh, things much more differentiated. And uh, of course, yeah. um, human rights and things belong also to, yeah, of course. Religion. But uh, the other uh, things, as uh, spirituality, as uh, believe in God, as uh, the script, holy script, and so on, have their uh, the room in it. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. No, that's uh, those are those are very good points and important points. Um, I think. Um, yes. Well, maybe I could have made more reference to specific. Um, national context uh, and of course there was no offense meant to the German system quite sincerely uh, there but I think your your point is also your, your it raises a very interesting point because in fact Britain in Germany the, ch the place of the churches in relation to religious education is much stronger but in Britain we also have a degree of interesting um, association and info, informing by religious communities of the curriculum. So the, our religious communities do have had historically played in particularly something called the Religious Education Council. But the relationship between the state and these bodies, of course, is much less clear than it is in Germany. Um, may, I, mean, I mean this in, in all sincerity, Johannes, that you know, maybe the German system Maybe the German system, where you have retained the integrity of the religious communities, is a far stronger model than we might have in the UK, where it's a much more looser association of a range of different religious traditions. But as we know, we also have to fit within that context, and I know Germany has to deal with this question, about increased and radical, not in the radicalization sense, but the radical pluralization of the society about who has ownership of that content within the curriculum, because that will surely be a future problem and issue even within the German context. Um, We have four more minutes left, so please. Just, just a question about, I, I, I feel um, that there's some ambiguity in, in the way I, I have heard it. On the one hand, I'm hearing uh, the strong version that I think I hear is that religious education has been co-opted by a, a, an outside agenda and okay. has thereby been uh, contaminated curricularly, uh, pedagogically, and so forth. But the softer version that I heard, especially in response to Jenny's question, is not so much that it's being co-opted, it's simply that you're trying to contextualize uh, the origins of some of these, these themes and concerns. Mm. Um, and so I, I just, um, there's Thank a little you, ambiguity. And coming yeah. from the American situation and yeah. knowing some of the people, some yeah. of the Americans who were involved in the drafting of the Toledo Guiding Principles, yeah. where <clears throat> they were coming from, was promoting the, the idea of a human rights-based approach to the study of religion as an alternative, as a way of dealing with the so-called culture wars. Yeah, yeah. It's in the U.S. and then now on the on the more broad international. Thanks, state. Bruce. That's uh, that's very useful. Um, yeah, I I, I I would hope really that the strong and soft versions, that ambiguity, uh, was conscious, and that the that, that, that the two can be side by side. There are strong versions, and there are, and there are soft versions. I think the contextualization is important, but I think in my strong version, my strong version is reserved for the fact that people are being in denial that there is a sec any security agenda whatsoever. So, I mean, if, you're not, if, you, if you've got the Counterterrorism and Security Act and, you, and you've got the, all of these impositions and the U.S. has got their own sorts of frameworks with, with the FBI and so forth, um, you know, then that is sort of problematic. So that is a very helpful um, distinction reflecting on my own position. I will reflect more on that, Bruce. That's, that's extremely helpful. You know, the strong and the soft version, I think, is, is, is very useful. Um, I might just, 
I might just, um, I'm not, this isn't a way to just get more slides in, but this is something I want, uh, what I think is um, some of my current work in relation to this, which is around the strong version. Okay, this is a paper I'm currently writing called The Kill Chain. In military terms, now I know people are going to say this is a provocative title and so forth. In military terms, it's where it, the stage a target is within the chain of command. Now you're going to say, what's this got to do with research in universities? If you are gathering knowledge, and universities have a relationship to these knowledge, as I've tried to outline, and this is relation to, to, um, to Bruce's point, Universities are fundamentally engaged in research at all sorts of levels. I chair the research, uh, one of our research committees at the University of Oxford and sit in the Interdivisional Research Committee. There will be research, go all the research would come through this committee to look at. There are some universities that are engaged in data gathering, issues of confidentiality, of anonymity, of ownership of research materials, this then becomes the real hardcore area. And there are instances, which I won't detail now, where this becomes a real problem. And areas about, if, if somebody was in, in interviewing or investigating, for example, in areas of radicalization, for example, with anonymized uh, participants, and all of a sudden, you get a call from our home office or for your intelligence agency through very indirect ways, perhaps through your office of your vice chancellor, and say, these people want hold of your anonymized data with the identifiers. This puts us then within that context of what military call the kill chain. And so this is not mucking around stuff. This is real lives. This is not abstract that I'm talking about. This is real lives, real people. It's not an abstraction. And it's happening. And I think it would be useful if some of my critics would at least, at the very least, acknowledge that it is and just recognize that I am trying to make some legitimate contribution to the wider debate. And that way we can move things forward. Last one, the microphone. <coughs> yeah, just uh, try to make some two very brief remarks. The first one is, uh, as I indicated yesterday, that we have quite a development in Germany at present in religious education, research, and discourse uh, that tries to rediscover the political dimension yep. of religious education. And we are much talking about that, that has been lost, you know, since the sure. 1970s, yep. when this uh, political and ideological uh, function of religious education was very much stronger discussed. And the second point I'd like to make is, is back to the confessional uh, model we have and, and, uh, and a historical reminiscence that may be helpful in this context. <coughs> because one reason why the confessional model was sustained after the Second World War was, of course, that religious education as tied sure. together with the religious communities at public schools was the only subject sure. under Nazi, um, 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 the Nazi regime, regime mm. um, that was not ideal, ideologi ideologized mm. Uh, and, and, and put under national socialist control because it was tied to the churches. So maybe uh, then there is some, could be some thinking about sure. what, the, what the role of the churches or the religious, uh, religious sure. communities are, uh, is in this respect. When you uh, have the suspicion that uh, religious education tends to be more and more functionalized, mm -hmm. politically functionalized, uh, could the religious community be a, a kind of counterweight and, and sure. a kind of resistance against this process? Yeah, fantastic, fantastic observation. I'll, I'll, I'll take some digesting of that. But, but there is, a, there is a, a UK parallel, of course. Our 1944 Education Act precisely set the same path of national unification uh, for English and Great British uh, uh, cultural life, national life, through religious education, particularly through issues of the Christian heritage. So that, 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 that is that, that definitely merit, fantastic. That's a very helpful man for it to merit some f further investigation, including historical analyses, I think. Thank you very much for this lively discussion. For